Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So this gospel passage, uh, it's very hard to not focus on this boy that in some translations has been called a lunatic. Um, this boy that convulses and, and uh, there's spirits in him. And, um, but reading it through this time and preparing to say something about it, it dawned on me like that the overriding thing, although this boy is very dramatic, the overriding thing is that there's a real crisis going on. We sort of enter into a scene that is completely in chaos. Jesus, we don't hear this today, but the passage right before this, like where Jesus is coming from, is the mountain of transfiguration. He's on the mountain with Peter, James, and John. They come down the mountain, and a man runs up to Jesus and says, Teacher, I brought my son to you. He has a dumb spirit. He's kneeling down before Jesus, and he explains what happens with this boy. And then he goes on to say, I brought him to your disciples, and they couldn't heal him. So this isn't the 12 he brought it to. This was the nine. Jesus had three up on the mountain with him, the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter, James, and John. And so what we've got at the bottom of the mountain that Jesus comes down is a man who's desperate and who has little faith. We'll learn, we'll learn that in the passage in a second. A bunch of disciples that didn't have enough faith to heal the boy. And scribes who are there arguing about the whole thing. This is what's going on. And a crowd. It's almost always this way with Jesus, right? He's either alone or in a crowd. This is one of those where he's kind of alone on the mountain. Peter, James, and John, Moses, and Elijah were also there. But, um, and the father who said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. So maybe it was crowded on the mountain as well. But when they come down the mountain, there's a crowd. There is a crowd. And all of them seem to have a problem. And the problem, this crisis, seems to be one of faith. Jesus comes down, and there's this crisis of faith at the bottom of the mountain. Lord, have mercy on my son. I brought him to the disciples, and they cured, couldn't cure him. We'll learn about the Father's faith where he says, if you can do anything to Jesus, if you can do anything. Now, the Father did not come and speak to Jesus like the leper does, who says, Lord, if it's your will, you can make me clean. Or like all the almost countless numbers of those with faith who come to Jesus, Jairus, whose daughter had died, Lord, just give the word. You don't need to come to the house. Just give the word. She'll be raised up. She'll be healed. Or even, and maybe the greatest example of this, is the woman that had the hemorrhage that reaches through the crowd and catches the hem of the garment of Jesus. There's no interaction with Jesus. There's no, it happens after. But before, she just has the faith and believes and gets a hold of him, and then she's healed. And Jesus knows it and calls her out. The father comes and says, if you can do anything, you know Jesus' very next line? If you can believe. They have this little battle, almost, you know, this little exchange. If you can do anything, the Father doesn't know who he's speaking to. He's speaking to the one who can do all things. So he says, if you can do anything, and Jesus says, if you can have faith, I'll put it back on you some. If you can believe. The next thing Jesus does is shout out, it looks like, faithless generation. Now, we're used to Jesus being really like sweet and compassionate and let the little kids come and all of that. And here we have one of those times where he kind of breaks out of what we expect of him and he shouts out, faithless generation. And it's totally appropriate. You know, in that setting, there's an almost faithless father, disciples who are lacking in faith, a crowd that is just watching, and then scribes who are actually faithless in regards to Jesus. They're actually challenging this whole thing and debating it. So he just shouts out, hey, faithless generation. Unbelief was the consequence. Corruption is the cause. Next thing Jesus says, bring me the boy. Bring him here. And the father had been asking that Jesus would have compassion. And he says it. It's very beautiful what the father says. 
have compassion on us. It's not just the son who needs the compassion, because any of us who are parents know if the child is sick, we're all hurting. It is all painful for all of us. And those of us just in a community, if any of us are sick, it hurts all of us. So it's have compassion on us, Lord, not just my son. You'll have to have compassion on me. If you can heal him, you'll have compassion on all of us. When Jesus says back to him, in response to, if you can do anything, Jesus says, if you can believe, the Father says a very counterintuitive thing. He says, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. I love this line. I think you probably do too. It is so good. But it's a little counterintuitive, and it would be the direction that we should have when we're fighting unbelief. If any of us, and it's not all of us, but many of us, we go through times of unbelief. In fact, most of us probably, there's a time where we struggle with unbelief. It's not uncommon. And the counterintuitive part of this is to say, Lord, help my unbelief. Help me. I believe. Help the part I don't. What's counterintuitive about it is when we feel like we have a crisis of faith, we feel separated from God. So we don't call on God to help us with our lack of faith, which is the only place we can turn to. The only place we can turn to is the Lord. On our own, we might be able to generate a slight faith. On our own, we might be able to like push ourselves to have some kind of hope. But to call on the name of the Lord, Lord, I believe, help the part where I don't believe you. It's counterintuitive. After the miracle of Christ, it says they all were amazed. Not just the father or the nine or the twelve or the crowd or the boy or the scribes. It says all of them were amazed. They were all amazed. Because the Lord had done something here with the Father's weak faith and against all those that lacked faith. He did something because he is the God of all. He's the one who can do everything. Now it ends with a little bit of a, a Lenten punchline, this gospel, and I think probably the reason we have it today is the disciples pull Jesus aside and say, why couldn't we heal the boy? Because they've seen, been able to heal the boys and been able to heal the people. They've been able to do things. The Lord had previously given them power to do this, and then it didn't work. So they said, why didn't it work? What 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 we miss? And he said, well, this one only comes out through prayer and fasting. The Lenten like punchline here, the Lenten theme, prayer and fasting. The two pillars of our faith, the two fires that can help us through fasting, and through prayer, this is attested to by generation after generation, that prayer and fasting is the help we need. Every week, the church gives us help we need. Prayer and fasting is the help we need to calm our hearts, our souls, even our bodies, to calm ourselves down, to destroy evil intention, evil deeds, revenge, envy, hatred, malice. We could go on. We resist it because we like to eat and drink. That's the truth. That's why we don't fast. We like to eat and drink. And the Lord kind of hands, hands us a, an opportunity and says, if you will set aside the eating and the drinking, if you will fast from it, you will find help for all the things we might be eating and drinking about. Not all of us eat and drink to solve our problems, but people eat and drink to solve problems. And the Lord says, if you would actually go the other way, a little counterintuitive, if you would go the other way and not eat and drink, you would actually have help over those issues. They would give you strength. By weakening yourself, you will be strong. Likewise, with prayer, prayer is not just a matter of asking God for all the things that we think we need. 
prayer is asking God for what he needs, like what he wants from us. Like, what is he up to? Prayer is a connection with the Lord, a speaking to him. What do you want from me? What will you have me do? It's formal with the books, and it's informal with the Lord. What is going on here? If you can believe, Jesus will say, all things are possible. So this, the fourth Sunday of Lent, entering into the fifth week, will we trust the Lord and believe? Will we call on the Lord when we don't believe? Will we call on the Lord and say, I don't really believe, and you need to help me believe? That counterintuitive, calling on him when we feel like he may not be there. Will we trust that he is there and take some steps? When we pray, we have to set aside all those petty things that we think will make our lives easier, health and wealth and whatever else. And the Lord is quick to give us whatever we really need. He is quick to give us whatever we need. Whatever we actually need, the Lord will give us. Lent is a little bit of a second chance at life. We've said this, that it's like the AED, is that what it's called? Not the, I'm doing that thing where you don't rub the paddles, but uh, the paddles they put on the heart and they jolt you, right? We said Lent is like the machine in the, in the narthex out here. Lent is also like standing on the porch of the mansion with the luggage and the door opens and they take the luggage from you and you get invited to this mansion. Well, now we've maybe been fighting this a while or doing it a while, and here we are deep into Lent. We are deep into Lent. Next Sunday is St. Mary of Egypt, which is the clue that we are close to being done. So that's where we are. We are two-thirds in or whatever the number is, 27 days or something, 29 days maybe, 29 days. Figure it out, but I won't. Uh, (laughs) Will we now, will we now embrace Lent? Will we finally trust the Lord? Will we call on him when we don't believe? Will we call on him when we don't believe? And watch what he does. And watch what he does. Because he is quick to answer this man's prayer. We have it on good authority. When you call out, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief, there's healing. That's the lesson. And the disciples say, why didn't it work? And he says, because we need more prayer and fasting. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.